Welcome back. Well, 2022 has been a stellar year for Indian banks with solid loan growth and an improvement in asset quality across names. To understand what 2023 could look like for the sector, and uh, you know, we have the biggest domestic lender now joining us. Dinesh Kumar Khara, the chairman at State Bank of India, is with us. Mr. Khara, good morning and uh, happy New Year to you, your entire team at State Bank of India. Uh, thanks for joining us on the show. It's been a phenomenal year for banks, especially PSU banks that have come out of a long lull uh, period of many years. But what do you see as the big triggers for 2023? Do you think loan growth could sustain at the levels that you've seen in the last quartile of this calendar year? Uh, good morning, first of all, and thank you very much for having me on your channel. I also wish all of you a very happy 2023. Thank you. Well, of course, when it comes to what we have witnessed in the current year in terms of the improvement in the quality of the bank books, I expect that the same trend should be continued in the coming year too. The reasons are very clear because the kind of growth which we have seen is essentially riding on the growth of the economy which we have registered. When the rest of the globe is looking quite dull, perhaps India is a shining star. And in that context, uh, we have uh, we are registered growth, which is around 6.8, 6.9. So hopefully, I think uh, I expect that um, on increased base also, the year 2023 will probably register a decent growth, which would be in the range of about 6 to 6.5 to 7 percent again. Uh, so I think if the real economy uh, economy performs well, you know there are ample opportunities for the banking system to support that growth. And last year, what we have seen is essentially a much better credit deposit right. ratio. And also in terms of the quality of advances, they were quite good. But Mr. Kara, so you know the last time when we spoke to you, you said that you're looking at a loan growth of 15 percent by the end of FY23. Given how things yeah. have improved, would you want to scale up that guidance further? What do you think FY24 could look like in terms of loan growth? I think uh, my expectation is last quarter, of course, we saw a very healthy loan growth, which is to the extent of 20-21%. But going forward, it will probably taper down a bit. But I still expect that 15-17% to 17 is something which should be a reality. Uh, considering whatever we have seen till now, looks like 15 to 17 percent would be a reality in, in the year 23-24. Right, Mr. Khara, hi, good morning. Uh, Prashant here. Uh, you know, we had uh, the Canada Bank MD yesterday with us uh, who told us that uh, they've hiked deposit rates uh, for customers recently to seven and seven and a half senior citizens. And uh, they, they, they got a huge response, a lakh crores in three weeks or so. Uh, how do you read that? Uh, well, of course, you know, deposit is only one side of the story. Mm -hmm. And we have to be very mindful of the fact that uh, a higher, uh, higher cost of deposit mm -hmm. also necessitate that the lending should also be at a higher rate. Mm -hmm. I think at a point of time when the growth is one of the prime objective, mm -hmm. we have to be very mindful in terms of the interest rates which should be charged from the borrowers. Mm -hmm. So I think keeping in, in, in view of that, we have to maintain a very fine balance between the deposit rates mm -hmm and also the lending rates and keeping uh, considering that uh, of course we have seen in the in, in the current year because of uh, increased uh, uh, loan growth there was uh, a scramble for deposit and interest rates have virtually gone up quite a lot but i would actually like to link it up with the policy rates mm -hmm. if at all it should be actually in sync with the increase in policy rates so uh, I would say that even that seems to be there also, there would be some kind of a rationalization. And uh, otherwise also when it comes to a deposit, we have got a very large deposit base and loan book. No, Mr. Kara, my, my, my point was that uh, uh, will, is, there, is there broadly speaking with what's happening at Canada and you said you mentioned the scramble for deposit. Liquidity is not what it used to be, right? I mean, uh, this tightening of liquidity now, a liquidity surplus in the system. Uh, will as we go into next year, next calendar year, uh, they be uh, will uh, uh, yields be a little uh, uh, more compressed as compared to what we've what we've seen because of rising rates? Uh, no, I'm saying that's why I'm saying that you know if at all inflation comes under check and control. No, but that is if we have already started. Yeah. No, no listen. Sorry. Go on. Listen. Yeah. So that's why I'm saying that you know when uh, I mean inflation will come in, uh, in check and control. 
policy rates also may not go up. If at all policy rates may not go up, the trend as far as the interest rate is concerned, it will undergo a change. It may not witness the kind of increase which you have seen in the current year. If at all it is, it, it, it remains static around the same level, you might see that, you know, the yields also will behave very differently. This is what, I, what my expectation are. But it's it could still be at a higher level than before, right? I mean, if they hold here and there is no further, although market expectation is that policy rates perhaps have a little more to go, 25, 30 basis points more. Uh, if no, anything, I would say that, yeah, yeah. if at all it goes by about 25 basis point, I think part of it has already been factored by the market. Right. There is no impact of all of this on uh, the pace of lending, uh, loan growth, etc.? Pace of lending, I don't think so, because, you know, when it comes to lending, lending is a function of the economic activity and economic activity is a function of the demand. And we are seeing robust demand and that's why I don't expect that to have any impact on uh, the lending books of the bank. Mr. Khara, you know, your book is very, very large and you pretty much represent uh, all segments of the economy uh, as, as, a, as the largest lender. But so, so many companies that we've had on our uh, programs over the last so many days are talking about a very distinct slowdown uh, in uh, their respective businesses. Uh, uh, you know, from uh, commercial vehicle financing uh, to, uh, you know, uh, retailers in tier two, tier three uh, cities, uh, you know, auto companies, especially on the two-wheeler side, which of course has been slow for a while, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it, is, is none of that kind of showing up in, uh, in, in terms of incremental demand for credit? Or you think it's uh, pretty robust uh, still? No, I would say that it is still quite robust and we are expecting uh, fairly decent growth in some of the sunrise sectors also, like the EVs and the lithium batteries, mm -hmm. green hydrogen, et cetera. And also, you know, post COVID and also in the, in the about last six months, ever since the, uh, uh, the contact intensive industry has, uh, has seen the kind of growth, which is more like a, uh, I mean, growth with a vengeance, I would say, because, you know, when it comes to hotels, transport, communication everywhere, you, uh, we get to see so much of rush. So that is something, this particular sector, which was reeling under trouble for a fairly long time during the COVID, it has come back with the whole of, uh, you know, uh, the fresh demand. And also I think uh, we expect that this demand will, will, will stay and it will continue. And even for that matter, even the ESG initiatives like the mm -hmm. renewable energy, et cetera, Will also be uh, the uh, will also be taking the credit from the banking system, and I think uh, the infrastructure, which remains one of the major focus area for the economy, that also remains uh, a, a recipient of the banking uh, banking credit. So I would say that uh, I mean some uh, sectors might witness some kind of a slowdown, but I would uh, say that I mean uh, till now we have seen. Even the rural economy, also agricultural sector, also witnessing a fairly decent growth. So I would, uh, I mean, the way I read the situation is that uh, there may be some aberrations here and there for a for, for a company in particular. But overall, uh, I mean, these sectors are quite promising as far as the growth opportunities are concerned. Mr. Khara, you know, of uh, the conversations that we've been having across uh, uh, the financial space, not only PSU banks, etc. One thing that really stands out is that. Not a lot of people are worried about asset quality anymore. Um, can you give us a sense of how much more improvement can we see in uh, your asset quality parameters going forward and the kind of recoveries that we can see? Because that's uh, what the unifying trend is right now across the financial space. Yeah, I agree. And uh, when it comes to chunky recoveries, perhaps may not be there because all those low-hanging fruits have already been plucked. But at the same time, there's a definite improvement in the ecosystem as far as the recoveries are concerned. It may not be through NCLT or IBC process, but you know the ecosystem which has got created has also enabled the uh, affecting the recoveries through OTS and uh, various kind of other resolution in terms of restructuring too. So I think uh, that is a very welcome trend. And uh, uh, as I mentioned, that the, uh, it appears that the low hanging fruits have already been plucked and now it would be some hardcore. But still, because of these enabling environment, uh, it would be possible to affect recoveries there also. So I would say that uh, the, in, in terms of quantum, it may not be as high, but still we would see some kind of recoveries coming in with the help of OTS, etc. And I think uh, that will 
uh, it will be some kind of a, I mean, pace of improvement may not be as high as we saw last year, but uh, still, I would I would say that there would be some incremental improvement as far as the asset quality is concerned on account of the recoveries which will be affected in the in, in the coming year. Oh, so you're saying there'll be further improvement in asset quality for banks like yours? Yes. Okay. This is what my expectation is. All right, that's great to hear. Uh, coming back to demand, you mentioned that a lot of new sectors is where you're seeing uh, demand coming from, whether it's EVs, lithium, battery, green energy, etc. Uh, what about corporate capex? Uh, has it come back in a big way? Uh, if you can share some numbers with us in terms of fresh project capex as well, is it back to what it was uh, pre-COVID? I would say that uh, if at all I look at the kind of investment commitments which have been made, Last year, uh, the the uh, total investment commitment was made by was to that you know about twenty trillion, and out of that seventy percent had come from the private sector. This year, the investment commitment made overall till the month of November was seventeen trillion, and again about sixty seven percent of the of the fresh investment which was committed was from the private sector. So I think with that kind of a trend, I expect that in the in the current year 2020, uh, 22, 23, I expect that this number should be somewhere in the range of about uh, of almost about 20 to 20, 25 trillion. So that is my expectation. So I think if at all that is the that's the kind of a situation, and more so, you know, on the uh, uh, when we when we look at the kind of investment which is coming in like Foxconn and some of these leading investments which are coming into the country, right. that will also bring in a lot of new opportunities for the industrial sector. And I think uh, uh, this uh, this trend is likely to continue for some time. PLI and those other initiatives which have been taken by government of India, that will also start yielding results. Defense sector has become another very promising right. sector. There, there, there are a lot of manufacturing opportunities which are emerging. All right. And finally, before we let you go, uh, Mr. Khara, from an industry standpoint, you know, uh, the last year was, uh, from a stock market standpoint, a year, uh, an year for PSU banks. Now, SBI has been looked at uh, slightly differently from all the other PSU banks. But just wanted to understand in the way they function and the processes, etc., have you seen a narrowing in uh, uh, the quality uh, difference between other PSU banks and SBI? And do you think that improvement is structural? I would not be in a position to comment much on what has happened in PSU banks. But as far as SBI is concerned, we are very clear that we are uh, ensuring that we should be ahead of the curve. And for that, whatever in improvements are required in terms of underwriting practices, in terms of collection, in terms of sourcing, in terms of digitization, et cetera, we are embarking upon all these new initiatives. And we are observing that it is actually yielding uh, benefits in terms of improved productivity for us, and which obviously uh, reflect into our profitability too. Do we see value unlocking in uh, the digital verticals this year, 2023? Uh, not value unlocking, but yes, of course, we'll be leveraging digital for improving the productivity. Okay, all right. Uh, Mr. Kara, we leave it at that. Thanks a lot for joining in and all the best for the new year. Uh, until we speak Thank again, uh, stay safe and thanks a lot for being with us on CNBC TV 18. By the way, K-Fintech, uh, the IPO, there's a listing today. So that happens in, I think, about a couple of minutes from now. We'll keep tracking that one closely. It's a pure OFS, so nothing goes to the company. But nevertheless, we'll track that one closely for you. For the market, still down almost about 100-odd points. Uh, the mid-cap index is down 250 points, so it's taking a bigger brunt. And there are big losers in the banking space. Punjab National Bank, HDFC Bank, Kotak are all your big losers at the moment. But the logistics space is in focus after a Nirmal Bang note uh, put out where they said that they have an optimistic view. The government is looking to lower costs from the sector to 8 to 10 percent of GDP from the current 13 to 14 percent. To discuss that, we are joined by key player Ram Praveen Swaminathan, the MD and CEO of Mahindra Logistics, joins us now. Mr. Swaminathan, thanks a lot for joining in. First, if you can just start by telling us what do you think the prudent way is to lower costs for the industry? Um, you know, the government aims to reduce it to 8 to 10 percent of GDP. Uh, but what are the steps that you think will help the government achieve that? Good morning, firstly, and I wish you all a very happy new year. Uh, I, I think, uh, you know, obviously, the total cost of uh, logistics is a combination of two things, purchase price of logistics plus the cost of inefficiency, inventory, uh, and so on. Um, I think uh, the, the big areas of focus uh, and opportunity in the near to medium term really are one, 
increasing the shift towards multimodal logistics. India is still very road dependent uh, from a surface logistics perspective, and that will be a big uh, lever of improvement. Uh, and the second one is uh, is efficiency in you know in just documentation processes, uh, right, um, and, and the quality of uh, you know infrastructure. Uh, I think there are very specific initiatives focused on all of those, and those should give uh, some big wins in the short term. All right. Uh, those, by the way, are uh, visuals coming in from uh, the new listing of uh, K FinTech. Uh, let's say with a mild premium has turned into a bit of a discount right now, sitting at the cut about a percent, but. Nothing really um, to write home about in terms of immediate moves. Uh, trading at, at par or probably a mild premium to its other uh, competitor CAMS, that is. So uh, that's the listing uh, opening bell for KFIN. We'll uh, move on to the conversation with uh, Mahindra Logistics then. Uh, uh, you know, uh, if, Mr. Swaminathan, if you could give us a sense of uh, how second half is likely to pan out for you, because a large chunk of your revenues come in from the Mahindra Group. Uh, and even larger in that comes in from the auto space. And Sony has been telling us, you know, so many new launches, waiting periods are extremely high, etc. So you should be relatively insular as against uh, others who've seen a bad festive season, right? Yeah, so I think first, uh, the first half of the year, we saw some really good revenue momentum across all our segments. Uh, I think revenue in the first half was up 32%. Um, and uh, you know, on a larger base, uh, you know, and I think the the, the traction continues. Uh, obviously, automotive is leading that traction. It's really strong right now. Uh, we have good momentum uh, both on the Mahindra and on non-Mahindra accounts. Uh, the Mahindra business is roughly half our revenue, uh, so uh, so it's good momentum there. Um, and, and I think our broader diversification strategy across all our markets uh, actually supports us in our ability to deal with downturns. Uh, in specific end segments. Uh, so second half, I think, is positive. Uh, I, I think momentum will be a bit slower than the first half, uh, but, the, but, the, but the direction is still positive. Uh, right. Uh, good morning. Uh, thanks for joining us, Mrs. Swaminathan. Prashant here. You know, what about the non-automotive side of things? A lot of uh, companies like... Uh, now, again, it's obviously not the correct comparison, but it gives you a sense. E-commerce companies, uh, even the from the unlisted space, uh, even in the listed space, a place like Blue Dart, Delivery, I mean, a lot of these companies have been talking about uh, a slowdown uh, in business. Uh, it, now, these are, of course, I mean, a lot of this is uh, not what you do, uh, and a lot of this is B2C as well. But at the end of the day, uh, a slowdown there will impact uh, what's happening uh, on, on the back end, right? B2B as well. So just give us some color, non-automotive. Yeah, sure. So I think e-com uh, no, e is fairly large, uh, reasonably large segment for us is probably 18 to 20% of our revenues on the supply chain side. Um, and, and that's one area, obviously, I think we are seeing, uh, we have seen a correction there. Uh, I think demand has still been positive. Uh, it's just that uh, I think a lot of capacity was created on the back of uh, the this first and second wave of the pandemic. Um, and there is some course correction, obviously, from our customers in terms of those capacities ads. Uh, so, for instance, uh, this festive, we have seen lower offtake than we expected, uh, and, and our sites did see lower utilization. Uh, we also saw lower demand for flex or temp uh, sites, which are normally uh, a short-term reaction to demand. Uh, but overall, volume still grew. Uh, so I think this is really a, a, a kind of a period correction in terms of, uh, of demand. Uh, should probably go on for a few more quarters, but uh, by... By next festive, we actually expect uh, you know things to kind of come back to a, a stronger growth path. Yeah, and uh, ecom is eighteen to twenty percent of your revenues. Uh, is that what you yeah, said? On this, yeah, on supply chain, uh, oh. it's from eighteen to twenty percent of our supply chain side. Okay, and you're saying that this is excess capacity getting kind of uh, it'll take longer to so in a way a time correction uh, for it's a time correction. Okay, uh, people have just put on more you know sortation fulfillment infrastructure. Uh, you know, and distribution infrastructure, uh, assuming higher growth power levels, and probably the growth's been lower than what was expected, and therefore there has to be some correction in capacity. So you're saying another four quarters before things uh, kind of uh, come back? Yeah, yeah, probably another two to three quarters at least. Uh, one will have to see how demand turns out. Uh, but but even on the outside, I think uh, by festive next year, we should see the correction definitely going through. Is right? there a slowdown in unit volume sales as well on, on, on the e-com side? Uh, yeah, growth has slowed down. I think that's the. I think it's not a, It's not moving backwards, but growth has slowed down on unit volume sales with the companies we work with.
Uh, I think value of you know, value in various categories has actually gone up positively. Uh, but with the customers we work with, we have seen uh, you know slowdown in volume growth. You speak about pandemic and the excess capacities built on e-commerce there, etc., and that not sustaining now. Uh, you know, uh, it's uh, purely coincidence that uh, we just get the news that Honasa Consumer, who's of course the parent company of uh, Mama Earth, has filed a DRHP with uh, the regulator. So we will have another D2C sort of player coming by on uh, the exchanges soon. But final question before we let you go, you do have a bunch of... Uh, Acquisitions as well, uh, there is Meru, just wanted to know about the turnaround out there, how's uh, that's playing out, uh, do we see profits on that one? And the second one, Rivigo, you bought that, have, uh, you know, uh, things been integrated out there? Do you have more sense of what synergies could look like in terms of incremental revenue and cost savings there? Yeah, so let me, uh, I think Meru was, let me just go on both of them, I, I think Meru uh, is well on path, I think we have shown a significant reduction in losses uh, uh, since the last six months, since we uh, in, you know, since we acquired the company, uh, and I think synergies are well on track. Uh, you know, we have uh, indicated that we expect the company, our, our mobility business, totally to be EBITDA positive uh, by the end of this financial year, and I think we are on, you know, we pretty much expect to be on track for that. Um, I think the the Rivigo acquisition again is on a three quarter kind of integration track. Um, I think most importantly, I think customer transitions have gone well. We've not seen uh, any drop in volumes, uh, right? Um, and uh, and in terms of cost and synergy optimization, I think plans are actually in execution. Right. Uh, so we you know, we expect uh, to be able to have uh, that turnaround completed through uh, the second half of next financial year. Uh, and as of now, we are on we are on track for that. Mr. Swami Nathan, thank you so much for joining in. Uh, wish you the sector a very good luck and. Importantly, a very happy new year as well. Um, very happy new year to you as well. Thank you for joining in. Now, time now to take a short break. Before we do that, the market's actually just holding on above that 18,000 mark. There's been a bigger decline uh, than what was indicated at the open. And from the option side as well, we are seeing a fair amount of action. A lot of call writing above that 18,050 call. What we'll do is actually take a short break, come back, focus on the market technicals itself. Mitesh Thakkar joins in with some technical ideas. Powered by Canara Bank. Together we can. Co-powered by Signature Global. Making India affordable. In association with AMNS India. And tested like Samsonite. Reimagineering brighter futures with smarter steels. Once an investor has assessed their financial goals, timeframes and risk appetite, the next step is to formulate a sound financial plan. It is important for investors to understand features of the financial products and whether they suit them, their investment philosophy and risk profile. Smart investors do not base their financial decisions on tips, rumours, hearsay from neighbours, acquaintances, friends or anyone who has anything to say. They do their own research or take advice from qualified and credible financial advisors. Always remember, it is important to choose the right financial products to meet your specific financial goals. एनएसी द्वारा निवेशकों के हित में जारी आग को फैलने से रोकना मुश्किल है पर नामुमकिन नहीं अब फायरवॉल टेक्नोलॉजी के साथ सेंचुरी प्लाई क्लब प्राइम आग से बचाए आवर सक्सेस रिफ्लेक्ट्स योर ट्रस्ट ग्लोबल बिजनेस क्रॉसेस रुपीस 20 लाख करोड़ थैंक यू कस्टमर्स स्टेक होल्डर्स and well-wishers. Canara Bank. Together we can. Okay, just uh, sort of uh, testing the 18,000 uh, kind of levels. So, 17,998 is uh, where we are at. You know, day before yesterday, around 18,000 perhaps, uh, let's, let's see, let's hope uh, things uh, find some kind of support. Uh, but day before yesterday's uh, low was 17,967. Uh, from where we saw that big uh, flourish of a recovery and the market ended about 120 points higher. Uh, Mitesh is with us. Mitesh, will these levels hold or you think uh, we'll see more pullback? 
Uh, Prashant, I think, you know, there could be uh, the downtrend restarting. I think, you know, the gap up was not, uh, the gap down was not filled. And uh, we have seen continuous selling pressure. So slightly trading with negative bias. In fact, looking at shorting opportunities on the stock side as well. Uh, Colgate is something, you know, which is breaking below its uh, uh, 200 day average. So uh, that's a sell. Uh, I would want to sell it once it starts trading below 1550. It's made a low 1551. So sell below 1550 with a stop at 1565 for targets of 1520. And the other one, uh, you know, which could possibly be taken as a sell call is IOC with the stop at uh, 7575 uh, 75 for targets of around less than 32. Okay, thanks a lot for that. Well, let's do one thing. Let's get a grip on what's happening in the world of commodities as well. Uh, for the equity market, it's under quite a bit of pressure now. 120 points gone and 400 points gone on the Sensex. But let's find out the latest on the commodity space. Manisha Gupta is with us. Manisha, morning. Morning, Sonia. Thank you for that. I'm looking at the soft commodities today and we have seen, uh, you know, this year begin with the concern about inflation, not just in the Indian markets, but globally as well. But as of now, we've seen many of these soft commodity prices come off. But even as we are getting into 2023, the concerns about the Russia-Ukraine war are still upon us. And then it is about weather concerns in India, Argentina, Australia, Brazil, US, and that has impacted crops in a big way. And then the street is also looking at the COVID uncertainty. We are looking at yet another variants coming in. The currency move Moves was a major indicator in this year. Dollar index will be on radar yet again. And Chinese demand, remember, it's a big one when it comes to commodity production and consumption as well. So much of the cues will continue to come in from China too. But look at the report card on what we've done in 2022 in sense of many of these soft commodities. So the soybean prices currently are trading at a six-month highs. And we've seen a strong 12% of a gain into this one. But when you look at the prices from its highs, we are down by nearly 13%. So some bit of a profit taking that we've seen in edible oils across. Wheat prices hit an all-time high in the international and the Indian markets as well. So even as the Indian markets continue to be on the higher side, the international markets clearly closing the year quite flat, down 39% from its highs there. Edible oil prices continue to see a decline and palm oil clearly was one of the things there. Down 13% in this year and down 42% from the kind of highs that we saw in this year. Rubber clearly is another story where we have seen weakness just about continue. So while it's 33% off its highs, it's 28% down for the year is how it's closing that one. And coffee, good news for the coffee lovers there because we are down 52% from the kind of highs that this year saw and we are negative by 24% in this year too. Take a look at the other commodities then and sugar should be on your screen because we are trading at around two-year highs in the international markets and we are closing this year up by five and a half percent but from the highs we are down by five percent in this year as well cotton has been yet another story all-time highs in the indian markets 16-year highs in the international markets as well and we are down by 26 percent in this year from the highs we are down by 45 percent as well Cocoa, well, there hasn't been a lot of demand in Europe and that clearly has weighed on to those prices. So down 2% from highs, but 4% up in this year. And corn is another one, up 14% for this year. It has been a positive one, strong demand, weak weather uh, impacting the crops there. But from the highs, it's down 18% as well. So trend clearly on there that from highs, many of these agricultural commodities have come off. And the street believes that we're not looking at those highs coming back in 2023. It is going to be majorly consolidation and weather is something that you'll have to keep an eye on. Right, Manisha, thanks a lot for that. Weather is something that we will keep an eye out on. That's the commodity corner. But just keep an eye out on the markets. We do have a tug of war between the bulls and the bears for 18,000 right now. The broader markets, though, have uh, uh, spoken about the direction they wish to take uh, right now. Uh, we are at the low point of trade for the mid-cap index as well, the widest that we have for the advanced decline ratio too. Uh, BHEL is uh, the stock which is currently at the low point of trade. PNB is the other one which is uh, falling further, 2.5% lower on that counter, IRCTC too, has moved to the low point. But uh, talking about, uh, you know, uh, the index itself, it is uh, 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 the December series expiry. There is a fair amount of call writing that we've witnessed at the 18,050 levels. In fact, in just the first hour of trade, the 18,050 call has uh, added uh, almost a crore shares in open interest. So bears are going to, you know, uh, jostle for that. Levels upwards of 18,060 will face a serious amount of resistance. Though bulls aren't yet giving up the fight, for 18,000, the 18,000 put has uh, continued to see open interest addition. So the 18,000 put comes up for you almost across shares. 18,000 call also sees a fair amount of writing, but the 18,000 put sees some open interest addition, saying that maybe 17,950 or uh, the recent low that we saw on the Nifty may get protected. Amalam, uh, I don't know if you have anything yet on Sriram Finance, uh, which is it's down 9% now. Uh, it started with a 5% cut and uh, it's only accelerated uh, very sharply on the downside. 
uh, as I said, we had and at the low point of the day, as we, you know, we had the management with us recently, uh, and uh, you know, nothing in their commentary indicated. They, it was not very bullish commentary as well. We had Mr. Chakravarti, uh, but it was not uh, you know bearish or anything of that sort. Uh, is uh, some uh, new slow? Uh, you know, we'll try and kind of dig deeper. But 1267, that's the biggest, by far the biggest large name, mm. uh, which is uh, seeing a cut. Sri Ram, uh, Sri Cements is another one. If we uh, can pull this up, uh, four uh, and a third of a percent lower. Uh, so that's a, again a liquid large name which is coming o coming under uh, quite a bit of pressure. Uh, and uh, the banks, PNB, IOB, and Bank of India, all down, but all down around two, between two and three percent. Uh, is uh, what we have. Market breadth now, uh, two and a half, almost two and a half is to one uh, in favor of uh, declines. For now, at the 18,000 level, we'll take a, another quick break. We are back. Uh, we get uh, chatting about uh, Reliance Industries on the other side. Uh, Prabal Sain of ICSA Securities, Jyoti Gulia of JMK Research talk about the roadmap uh, for uh, India Inc.'s green hydrogen and renewable energy transition uh, that's uh, coming up in just a bit. आज तबीयत ठीक नहीं लग रही तुम ही सब काम निपटा दो ना अरे टेंशन किस बात की सेंचुरी एमडीएफ का लो एमिशन प्रीमियम प्लस है ना हाईर डेंसिटी है वाटर रेजिस्टेंट भी है यानी ये है जहाँ नो टेंशन वहाँ लो एमिशन प्रीमियम प्लस बाय सेंचुरी प्रोवोड For how long will you continue being tensed about the future? Pension can free you from future's tension. With LIC's new Pension Plus, make your own pension plan because this plan creates market-linked wealth for your future. Moreover, this plan comes with guaranteed additions and also offers various options for receiving pension so that you grow young and tension-free. LIC, har pal aapke saath. Life will test you. It will turn your world upside down again and again and again. The only way to hit back is to stand up, stand up every time, and say, "I'm not done." With ICICI Direct Markets Execution Algos, just set your instructions and the app will do the trading for you. Karo, to ICICI Direct Karo. Investments in securities market are subject to market risks. Read all the related documents carefully before investing. Welcome back to Bazaar Corporate Radar. Let's now put the focus on the renewable and green energy sector. According to a Nirmal Bang report. Private capex announcement in the uh, sector is above the pre-pandemic levels in FY23 between April and November period, and a major portion of this capex has been planned towards renewable energy. Uh, to discuss the outlook on the energy space, what's the roadmap for India Inc. in the renewable energy space? We have two gentlemen, Prabal Sen, the energy analyst at ICICI Securities, and Jyoti Gulia, the founder and uh, CEO at JMK Research. Jyoti and Prabal, thanks for joining in. Uh, Prabal, let me start with you. Uh, you know, a major portion of this capex has been planned towards the renewable energy sector. We understand, but can you help us with the numbers? What do you think 2023 could look like in terms of private capex towards the sector, and what are the big triggers for the year? I'm um, honestly, uh, we don't look at renewable energy uh, specifically, except to the extent that it impacts, let's say, Adani, uh, Adani Gas or Reliance. So we know that Reliance has announced or announced a few years earlier a 70,000 crore capex plan, which now seems to be getting upgraded if you take into account the kind of acquisitions that are being made and the ambitions that keep growing uh, very clearly. I think anywhere between 70 to 80,000 crore of capex will be spent by Reliance alone. Uh, 
uh, Adani has announced an even more ambitious plan. You know, they have probably spent, they have, I think, announced something in upwards of around $10 billion, uh, 10 to $20 billion, actually, uh, in the next uh, few years in terms of the green energy space. Very clearly, I think, in terms of overall energy capex, including oil and gas and renewables, renewables will probably far outpace traditional fossil fuel or even downstream investment in India, as is the case probably in most of the other developed countries over the next uh, decade. So I think that that momentum, uh, you know, will continue to shift uh, even traditional energy companies like, you know, IOCL or, or, you know, some of the other government PSUs have announced that they would be ramping up their presence in the hydrogen segment or in terms of building up their solar portfolio. Uh, you know, uh, even Gail has talked about building up their renewable energy portfolio in a more meaningful way. So I think the, uh, you know, in terms of the overall capex, I, I would say I would say that uh, renewables will probably continue to have a lion's share, but very difficult to state, uh, you know, exact specific numbers. I, I you know, I, I don't have the exact data uh, with me at this point of time. You know, you have a point there, Prabal, uh, when you're speaking about a lion's share coming in from renewables, etc. And you did speak about a lot of... Uh, announcements made by uh, large players as well. But just to take that point a little further, NTPC is exploring green methanol production. Um, is it uh, easy for, you know, traditional hydrocarbon companies like ONGC, Oil India, has the transition rate out there slowed down? And uh, what happens to the multiples of businesses like uh, IOCL, BPCL, HPCL? I mean, I'm speaking purely from an investor standpoint. Companies which get into a renewable space do they get a higher valuation multiple? How do you play this theme from an investment standpoint? Um, that's the that's the idea for sure. Uh, that you know the renewable business can create an inflection point with an additional investment coming in. It can create a very different return profile if you can actually get it right. You you very correctly mentioned that you know the execution of these projects, the adoption of these new technologies, and the ability to blend them with a traditional fossil fuel business, which isn't really going away anytime soon. The fact of the matter is that, you know, the even the most ambitious plans, uh, let's say for Reliance, would be that renewable energy becomes about 10 to 15 percent, excuse me, 10 to 15 percent of the overall consolidated EBITDA. A, 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 you know, and this is not their number, this is our sense in terms of, you know, looking at the investment and the kind of growth that can happen. So, so from a transition perspective, I think uh, very clearly renewables, because if you can get it right, it's a cleaner business. It 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 sort of leads to a you know it it uh, takes you away from the traditional polluting fossil fuel uh, business mix. Obviously, the multiples will be of a very different nature than the typical six to seven times or a five to seven times multiple that uh, you know a traditional uh, uh, downstream uh, energy business will get. So uh, uh, that, sure. that is very clearly, I think, the ambition, not just from an ESG perspective, but from a valuation perspective, uh, you know, moving to a cleaner uh, fuel regime would definitely improve the return profiles and therefore the uh, the multiple profiles okay. for most uh, of these sure. businesses. Got that. Jyoti Gulia, who's the founder and CEO at JMK Research, also joins in. Jyoti, what do you think the focus area would be this year in renewable energy? Will it be solar, wind, hydro? And what are the numbers that we're looking at? Uh, so definitely the focus uh, will be on solar uh, and the battery storage. There are two majors, uh, you know, PLI scheme uh, is been announced by government last year, uh, uh, you know, as part of which Reliance is one of the beneficiaries in both the, uh, you know, schemes, one for the solar manufacturing, another for uh, uh, ACC uh, battery storage advanced uh, cell, cell chemical industries that are there. So definitely the focus, uh, the immediate focus is solar. And uh, we are seeing in the market, you know, even the government has announced, uh, you know, uh, it's, its target of uh, 450 gigawatt of uh, capacity, non-fossil fuel capacity by 2030. And to reach to that capacity, every year we need almost, uh, you know, 30 to 35 gigawatt of new capacity addition uh, in this sector in solar and wind. So uh, there is there is one trend that we are seeing in the market is definitely, uh, you know, the market is shifting from plain vanilla solar and wind uh, technology to pure play, you know, round the table. Uh, so the end utilities, the discoms are demanding firm power and because of which uh, even the government entities are issuing tenders, which are round the clock tenders. 
that are there where the CUF uh, availability is uh, asked, you know, to be around 70 to 80 percent of it. So, uh, yes, definitely, uh, I can see, you know, given the annual demand of 30 to 35 gigawatts, solar and uh, uh, round the clock power, if you merge it with thermal or with pumped hydro mm. storage or with battery storage, that will be game changer. You know, uh... Everyone's talking about green hydrogen being a game changer and one of the uh, energy sources for the future as well, Jyoti. So currently it's around 10 rupees per kg if uh, I get my numbers here. And do we have the capabilities to bring it down to say 1 to 2 rupees per kg? I mean, same is the case for other renewable energy uh, uh, sources as well because it's uh, good so long as it's affordable. That's the view. Uh, that's true, uh, but I think uh, there is still time for that. It will take another four to five years for green hydrogen to make start making economic sense. And uh, the company in focus reliance is actually in right direction. It is, uh, you know, growing inorganic, inorganic. Uh, through acquisitions and also acquiring stakes in the companies wherein it can leverage its technology uh, expertise also. So if, uh, you know, uh, it is also setting up vertically integrated facilities uh, to bring down its costs. So eventually, yes, four to five years down the line, uh, we can uh, we can look at these numbers, numbers, but right now the cost economics are not making sense for green hydrogen. Solar is still go to source uh, in terms of cost economics at present. Okay, all right. Uh, well, thanks a lot, uh, Jyoti, as well as um, uh, Prabal for joining in to this discussion and for the in the renewable energy space and the big triggers to watch. Thanks for being with us on the channel. But for now, don't lose sight of what's happening in the market. The Nifty is down over 111 points. The mid-cap index is down about 300 points. So the start has been on the weaker side. The only saving grace, perhaps, is the fact that there's been no accelerated mm. selling pressure. The selling pressure has been arrested around these levels itself. So the Nifty is holding on to that 18,000 level uh, by the skin of its teeth. Remember, the flows have been on the muted side as well, but FI has continued to sell. Uh, so yesterday, FI sold almost 900 crores. So the trend is definitely on the downside. Important to see if this 18,000 level holds or not. And on the upside, the 50-day moving average of 18,235 is something that continues to be a bit of a resistance for the market. So not a great opening to trade today. The Sensex down almost 400 points. But let's see. Uh, we still have the rest of the day. Let's see. We have the rest of the day. It's a wonderful arm wrestling match which is yeah. taking place between the bulls and the bears at 18,000. But we're seeing some signs of recovery in a few mid-caps. Fertilizers, a pack that has been doing well, has now seen a recovery from the lowest stumble. Fertilizer, for instance, has uh, moved higher. We are seeing some recovery in the likes of SRF, etc. as well. I mean, far away from home still for the mid-cap end of things, but it is so showing signs of amelioration. So uh, to that extent, it makes the second half a lot more interesting. With that, we wrap up on this edition of Bazaar Morning Call. You stay tuned to CNBC TV 18.